It's my uh, privilege to introduce another young speaker. I think, uh, you know, I've always wondered, uh, not that Dub is ever going to die, <laughs> but, but he may want to retire. I don't know. <laughs> Who's going to take, uh, you know, these stalwarts of the faith? Who's going to take their place as they shuffle off into the sunset? <laughs> Well, I'm encouraged by the by those that have been the young ones that have been speaking uh, during this lectureship that uh, maybe I shouldn't be so apprehensive about the future because uh, I think we have some very highly qualified uh, young men that are that are coming up and you know be ready to take their place. Eric Paluca, of course, is a member here, but his prominence goes back to to uh, Fish Hatchery Road. I guess they lay claim to him, uh, right? Okay, they lay claim to you. <clears throat> Born in Corpus Christi and graduated in, in high school in Cameron. And he graduated from Sam Houston State University in 2011 with a, a bachelor's in agriculture and engineering and a minor in chemistry. Currently employed with bomb shelter diesel. <clears throat> and that's where Mark works, right? My, yeah. That bomb shelter is getting a little crowded, isn't it? <laughs> Y'all going to have to slim up, i tell you that for sure. <laughs> He's engaged to be married to Lauren West in October of this year and is a member of the Spring Congregation, as I said. He's going to speak on a, a subject that, like so many other perversions, has become uh, very commonplace today, and people really don't think about it at all. If you ever listen to the news, when the Powerball gets up to $500 million, you know, they they think it's what a great thing it is. I always said that, uh, I've said before that uh, when these Powerball things, you know, come to fruition, that, uh, you know, I did not win the Powerball. And my chances were just as bad as good as anybody else's chances. <laughs> the only thing is, I didn't buy a ticket. <laughs> and that's, uh, but people just throck to it. So he's going to speak on to this, about this, and going to tell us all about the dangers and, and why we should avoid it and so forth. Right? Come speak to us. Thankful for most of those kind words. Uh, I am trying to slim down regardless of what he said. <laughs> um, it is most certainly a privilege and an honor to stand before you this time. Um, like he said, fish hatchery, that basically is when my training started. Uh, so I'm, I'm thankful for those who have given me this opportunity to stand before you now and likewise for those who took part in my preparation. As said, my topic is considered gambling. Okay, following with this theme, gambling. When you look out into the world, especially the United States, gambling is a problem. It's a plague. It's everywhere. In fact, you can perform this act of gambling, no matter what age you are, anywhere you want to. <clears throat> one thing we must realize, too, though, that it takes various forms. It doesn't have to be in one type. Okay, this is gambling, but this is not. It's, a, it's an act. It's a, pr a principle that you, many engage in. I would venture to say that most of us here know of at least one person who has or continues to gamble, and many might even have seen the devastation that this act causes. Before we go any further, I always like defining my terms. What do we mean by gambling? Well, Webster's Dictionary says it's to play a game in which you can win or lose money or possessions, to bet on an uncertain outcome, venture or hazard, the betting on the result of a game, the playing of a game of chance, or skill for skill stakes. Now when you bring this topic up to many of the world, say, well, why do you gamble, what, it's bad, well they'll say, well, it's not in the Bible. You can't say it's, it's wrong, it's bad. You can't judge me. Particularly with those of the denominational background will usually tell you that. But 
If you do search for that word, the word gamble is not in the Bible. But I would point to the cross to find gambling. John chapter 19, verses 23 through 24 says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and, all, and also his coat. Now that coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now, as we've said, the, the word gamble is, is not mentioned in the Bible. But we just saw a picture of it. Gambling actually took place in the Bible. Now, before we go too much further, in my research, there was some things that came up as far as psychologically speaking. Why is gambling, why does it appeal to certain people? Well, gambling... The urge to gamble is basically a perversion of three basic desires that we have. One, desire for gain. I like getting stuff. Kind of fun. Number two, the lust for excitement. Well, some people like getting an adrenaline rush. Let's jump out of an airplane. Get, let's get those adrenaline. Let's get that going. And three, the instinct of combativeness. Who, who, who wants to lose? Everybody wants to win. Put all threes together. You've got an urge to gamble as far as the perversion side of it goes. Now, I'm, again, many of us have probably seen the uh, vicious downward cycle that gambling can cause a person or even a family. Whoever participates in gambling, one of those will either be a loser or a winner. When we're engaged in that, the winner, like we just said, desire for gain, the winner is going to want to keep winning keep gaining more money or possessions or whatever it may be. Now the loser, what's the loser more likely going to do when we deal with gambling? Are they going to stop? More, more often than not, I want to make up the money I just lost. So let's, let's do one more. One more after that. Now again, we need to understand that gambling can take various forms. Uh, we've seen, I know I've seen on TV, poker. Playing Texas Hold'em or whatever else. Poker is pretty popular. Uh, other card games, playing dice, as mentioned earlier, the lottery, dog racing, horse racing, slot machines, bingo, snail races, whatever else, whatever you want to race, there's probably some money going on there. Bingo, raffle tickets, and the list can go on after that. A couple years ago, we went to the movie theater and watched Secretariat. I wasn't around then, but I was told that's based on a true story. I was looking up at the screen and it's like, man, I see why people gamble on this. I was watching that race and my adrenaline got going. My heart rate increased. I was like, this is really entertaining. This is exciting. Now, I didn't want to go buy a ticket or anything, but I can understand this gets your blood pressure and your adrenaline going. Now, Powerball was brought up a while ago, and so was Bomb Shelter. Um, <laughs> Every now and then, some folks get together and, hey, you want to go, let's go buy some Powerball tickets. They know better than to ask me. I've already told them no, and they, don't, they probably think I'm crazy, and that's fine. Um, but a few of them got together, let's go buy some Powerball tickets. And they, well, I overheard them because I was packing an order or whatever, and they were saying, like, yeah, 20 bucks a ticket. So five of them got together. The pool was $100. So I kept asking them, I said, so when are you going to do the Powerball? I, I knew what was going to happen. They finally came, and I don't know, I guess you watch TV for it or whatever. And the day after, I heard the results that nobody won in this area. So I was like, let's go capitalize on this. So I, I went and asked them, so, so how would you all do in Powerball? Did you win? No. How, well, they, they didn't win the jackpot, but they did win some money. I think it came up to a whopping $12. I looked at him, I said, you spent $100 on 12 Yeah, basically. And I looked at one of them in particular, he's like, I, I told him, I asked him, does that make sense to you? 
Yeah, but you could always win. There's that chance for that jackpot. I looked up last night. The, uh, the jackpot's around like 500. Well, that's actually your chance to win. One in 500 billion. <laughs> but you could always win it. So I got a pretty good kick out of that. We, we've heard several times, I know I've seen on TV, the gentleman's bet. Oh, here's a dollar that you can do this. I say a dollar you can't. Well, another example. Ten bucks says my car will start before yours will. I'll put all these parts in it, souping it up to be a hot rod. I think I can get mine started before yours. Folks, you just gambled. And what about the carnival games, the fair games? Uh, this is one I was I dealt with personally because I didn't know any better. I won me a guitar at Six Flags. The guy says, you get you this ball and chuck it in this barrel. They're all laid on their sides, and you're supposed to spin it a certain way. It's just going to roll around and stay in there. If you do that, I'm talking one of those huge barrels you put toys in. If you win that, we'll get you one of these prizes. I'm like, all right, cool, let's do this. I don't know how much I spent, but I didn't think about it. I thought it was pretty fun. At some point, the guy just felt sorry for me. He goes, sir, here's your guitar. It's like, all right. This is great. Well, I, I later realized and was taught better that that was actually gambling. And that's true. You just spent how much money? I've, I've heard several country songs about, I think one of them Tim McGraw, took his girlfriend to the carnival and talking about winning that teddy bear. So spend 50 bucks, get a burnout shoulder, and finally get a teddy bear. For that much, you could go buy a teddy bear, some chocolates, and some Dr. Pepper to watch it all down with. <laughs> Gambling is not only wrong, but it doesn't make sense. You're going to spend however much money on chance. So, but we'll go into that in a little bit. But no, no matter what you try to do to sugarcoat gambling, gambling, betting, placing wages on your certain uncertain outcomes, it's still gambling. No matter how you try to dress it up, make it look pretty, it's still gambling, it's still ugly. Now. Getting to the Bible of the matter, like we said before, gambling is not specifically mentioned in the Bible as gambling. But as later in this past lesson, we want to look at some principles as to why it's wrong. With that in mind, Colossians 3.17, it's a verse that we all hear and for right reason. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. With this in mind, let us examine why gambling is wrong through the principles the Bible lays out. Before that, I would like to take a few more minutes to look at some statistics. I like numbers. This is pretty neat. I have five of them for you. First, wagers spend roughly $500 billion annually. That's billion with a B, beta, not million. $500 billion every year. Number two, of all the adults in the U.S., 2.5% are considered problem gamblers. They consider a problem gambler one that's actually addicted to gambling. That's not just, oh, let's get a lottery ticket every week or whatever. That's people who actually have problems with it. Excuse me. You do the math on it. I realize not everybody is an adult, but it's still an alarming number. 2.5% doesn't sound very much. But when you consider... The U.S. population of 316 million people, this means almost 8 million people, 8 million adults almost, are problem gamblers. That's a pretty high number. Third, those who are addicted to gambling are more likely to have depression and mood swing disorder. Well, go figure. Fourth, gamblers are twice more likely to divorce than non-gamblers. Again, who would have thought? And fifth, gambling, this is what really, really hit me. Gambling costs society $7 billion per year due to lost productivity, crime, and bankruptcy. $7 billion literally down the drain. <coughs> now to what the Bible has to say about it. First, gambling violates the golden rule. We tend to call this verse, Matthew 7, verse 12, the golden rule, and rightfully so. It's truly golden in its application. It says, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. 
When someone gambles, they intend on winning. Otherwise, why do it? Which implies there must be a loser. Would we, li- would we want to lose? Do we like losing? I know I don't. Why would we make somebody else lose? Why would we wish that on someone else to lose? I know when I played football, we always wanted to win. Sometimes we did lose. We, we woke up the next morning bruised up. Those are going to heal. Practice is going to make us better. But you're not playing for the glory of winning. You're not playing for a trophy or a state ring. You're playing to take possessions from other people. Can you honestly say that you're going to wish that on somebody else? When you, when you get to the meat of the matter, when you gamble, do you wish losing on someone else? Consider Hebrews 13, verse 6. Likewise, 1 Thessalonians 5.15, which we'll read, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Second, this leads into our next point. Gambling violates the law of love. And in our particular society, love is another word that gets used, reused, and abused on a regular basis. So we need to turn to the Greek on this. I did a little bit of research on it. For, our, for this particular lesson, I'd like to examine three different definitions of our word love in the Greek. First being agapeo. Agapeo is said to love in a social or moral sense, to be full of goodwill and exhibit the same, to have a preference for, wish well to, regard the welfare of. Secondly, we have agape. These two are related. They sound very similar. Agape, love, that is affection or benevolence, specifically a love feast, charity, dear, again says love. Our third definition, Philadelphia. This is a fraternal affection, brotherly love, or kindness, love for the brethren. With these definitions in mind, I want to look at some few subpoints. In uh, John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus commands us to love one another. He uses agapeo here. It says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. He also commands us to love our enemies in Luke chapter 6, verse 27, and also verse 35, same chapter. Likewise, Matthew 5, 44. He says, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And we see this, this principle carried out in Galatians 6.10. It says, As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them which are the household of faith. Can the gambler truthfully say that they are full of goodwill towards who they're taking money from? Are they actually and honestly concerned about that person's welfare? I dare say not. The great chapter of love, 1 Corinthians 13, gives us a perfect portrait of the word agape. Our second term. I won't, I won't read the whole chapter, but I would like to take a look, a look at uh, six of those verses. Beginning in verse 1, says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Now drop down to verse 13, says, Now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, the greatest of these, is charity. We also find in Romans 13.10, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, who's, who's the neighbor? Who's our neighbor? Well, it seems like that question has been asked. Thankfully, Jesus answered that for us in Luke 10, verses 30 through 20, or 37, rather. The Good Samaritan. Who was the, the neighbor in that picture? Okay, Jesus tells us it's everyone in need. 
Again, we pose the question, when the gambler wins, is he or she showing affection for the person they just literally robbed, won against? Are they treating their neighbor, brother, or even the enemy the way Jesus commands us to? Again, certainly not. Now we look at our third definition, Philadelphia. In the words of Peter, 1 Peter 1, 22. It says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. And in Hebrews 13, 1, we're commanded, Let brotherly love continue. Are you going to rob your brother? Some do. Again, let's consider 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. Furthermore, when we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God, who hath given unto us his Holy Spirit. By the way, that word defraud, Thayer says it's, comes from the Greek word pleonectio, which means to be covetous. That is, by implication, overreach, to get an advantage over, make a gain. Does it make sense to have brethren say we love them and then take their money? Now, there's two sides of that. If the brethren is there losing money, both of you shouldn't be there. But even so... I am defrauding my brethren, could be a neighbor also, could be my enemy when I take their money in gambling. Next, gambling promotes laziness or slothfulness. In the Garden of Eden, after the fall of man, God punished the man in Genesis 3, verses 17 through 19. It says, Unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow thou, thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns, also thistles, shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of, the, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. We have a similar command in Ephesians 4, cha- or chapter 4, verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. And also uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Now, if if I'm pretty good at gambling, I'm not. I wouldn't know. But if I was... If I was good at counting cards or whatever they do, good at getting money, why would I ever want to work? Why would I still be at bomb shelter diesel supply? If one chooses to gamble, they're not gaining money in an honest method. In fact, they're, they're violating these commands, something we ought not do. Next, gambling is a violation of our stewardship. I was a little, little worried earlier when stewardship got brought up. But thankfully, he didn't use all my verses. But it's obviously, we're teaching from the same book, so you're going to have a little bit of overlap. Steward is defined as a house distributor, that is, manager or overseer, an employee in that capacity, by extension, a fiscal agent, a treasurer. We would probably think of it more likely as our modern-day Jew idea. They're so tight with money. This is the kind of steward we should be over the things we've got. In 1 Chronicles 29, verse 12, King David proclaims to the people, Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, 
and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. It was brought up earlier, but I must read it again. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Whether we realize it or not, take a step further, whether we care or not, we are blessed by God, and therefore we are stewards over those things that He's blessed us with. Now, it doesn't mean, oh, I have a lot of money, I'm a steward over that, or if I don't have any money, I'm not a steward. No, we each and all have material wealth. It might not be much, but it's still a blessing from God. And we're charged by God to be a steward over that material wealth. Thus we arrive at 1 Corinthians 4.2. It says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Great, but what does that mean? I'll point you to uh, parable of the talents, Matthew twenty-five fourteen through thirty. Also, the parable of the rich fool, Luke chapter twelve, verses sixteen through twenty-one, and also to the parable of the pounds, found in Luke chapter nineteen, twelve through seventeen. We have a, a picture painted here that a ruler leaves to go get his kingdom. He distributes the money among his servants. He comes back and finds some of the servants actually did something. Well, <clears throat> one of them brought back ten of those pounds. Well, let's, let's look here. I didn't want to read the whole, the whole passage because I am limited by time. I wouldn't mind taking it up, but I know some people might not like that. <laughs> Verse 16 says, uh, of chapter 19, verse 16 says, Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise unto him, Be thou also over five cities. Another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou laidest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up where I laid not down, and reapest where I did not sow. And then dropping down to verse, uh, verse 27, but those mine enemies, which would not, that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. When judgment day comes, we're going to be judged based on the type of steward we were in this life. If we're just going to throw our money to the powerball, to vehicles running, to whatever else, how good of a steward are we? Think about that. Gambling violates the law of providing. Let's say one does gamble. Ah, I'll just use me. Let's say I go gamble. Where's that money coming from? Right now it's going to be my bank account. But later on it might come from joint bank account. And guess where that money could go? Paying bills. Buying groceries. Much farther down the line, buying diapers buying shoes everything else the list goes on what a family needs well might lose a dollar every now and then let's say I, I lose a lot of money you reckon I can take care of my family with that money I just lost obviously not what if I uh, win big now it's more opportunity to take care of my family right sure but now I just help violate somebody else's law or somebody else's providing ability. So there's two edges to that sword. 1 Timothy 5 verse 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. If you can't provide for your own family, you're an infidel. Worse than an infidel. Proverbs 11.29 says, He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind, and the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. 
One simply cannot make the claim that they love another, be it their family, their friend, or whoever else, and still gamble. It's an absurdity. If you're still taking money from your family, whoever, your friends, and you're losing it. You're wasting it. Gambling violates the law of contentment. As we stated before, James 1.17, all good things come from God. And when you look at this nation compared to most of the world, we are truly blessed. Look at Texas and overall how we're, we have a successful economy. Even further, we're blessed, truly blessed. Now, what if all of that just happened to go away? Red Dawn happens, the, the communists take over, and everything that we know of dissolves. Where are we going to be if and when that happens? I know where I'd like to hope, or I know where I'd hope to be. In my first few years of what I thought to be a Christian, I later found out I was not, and I changed that. There were a few passages that helped me get through those times in dealing with our home life. Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13 begins, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. When you look at the average gambler, they might win once or twice. Let's say they do win. That hunger keeps growing. I win once, let's do it again. And again, and again. They're never content with what they have. Otherwise, they wouldn't be gambling. Again, the loser, first of all, they weren't content enough to have or keep what they had to start with. Now they lose. Rather than take a step back, cut our losses, let's move on. No, they keep going. Not content with the hand they're dealt, pardon the pun. I was always told when uh, first thing you do when you realize you're digging a hole, stop digging. Most people can't learn, seem to learn that principle, especially in this topic of gambling. The second passage that held me was sec, or 1 Timothy chapter 6, 6 through 8. For the purpose of this lesson, I'd also like to add verse 9 into that. It says, But godliness and contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Verse 9, But they that will be rich, they that will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Excuse me, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Contentment is an attitude. And until we change our attitude, we're not going to be content with anything. In fact, it was, it was said to me that if you are not content with nothing, you will never be happy with everything. Next, gambling is a form of covetousness. The word we get, covetous, comes from the Greek word pleonexia which is defined as avarice, that is, by implication, fraudulency, extortion, covetous, practices, greediness, holding or desiring more, that is, eager for gain, hence a defrauder. And we defined that term a little bit ago. We're told in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Jesus warns us of covetousness in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Well, I guess I'm going to have to take 20 pages off. <laughs> it is. Oh, boy. And then we are later commanded to mortify or put to death covetousness, which is also idolatry, um, Colossians 3, five, And any who practice set this said sin will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-10. through 10. 
In Joshua 7, verses 19 through 25, we're given a very vivid picture of what God thinks about covetousness. I was always told Achan was bacon. Well, Achan, Achan coveted some things from the land they were trying to take over. Found out to be guilty, and they took him out and stoned him. Now, I wonder if we did that today, how much issues we'd really have. I'm not saying do it, but I'm just... I like to think about that every now and then. If, if we actually had punishments, not necessarily stoning, but actual punishments instead of go to prison or go to jail, actually do something to them, would we actually have the same problems? Yes, but not to the degree that we do today. <clears throat> concerning, covetous, we, concerning covetousness, we are exhorted to do just the opposite. Acts chapter 20, verses 32 through 35 we commonly read this before giving of the offering. We're commanded to give to those that have not. Uh, Proverbs chapter 21, verses 25, yeah, 25 through 26. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. Now to recap over points we've discussed. One, when we gamble, we violate the golden rule. We don't like losing, but we're willing to make somebody else lose. Two, it causes us to have a hypocritical love or a lack of love to everyone around us, neighbor, family, whoever else. Three, by gambling, we become lazy, slothful, poor providers. Why would we want, well, if we, if we can do that, like I said earlier, why would we, why would we not accept that free ride? And four, it makes us poor providers for our families, or even ourselves. And five, when we gamble, it makes us poor stewards over what all God has granted us to have, blessed us with. Six, it is either a manifestation of, or it makes us less content with the things we do have. Either way, contentment would need to be taught, learned, and applied in that person's life. Seven, it causes us to be covetous. Or it might be, again, a manifestation of that covetousness. Money can become our idol. It doesn't have to be a little wooden block that looks like Zeus or Apollo or whoever else, Hades, whoever else. It's what we bow down to, what we put higher than God in our lives. Most importantly, it will cause us to lose our soul. Mark 8, verses 36 through 37. For what shall it profit a man... If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, for what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And again, I want to emphasize that gambling uses tools. Okay, poker in and of itself is not bad. I do like me some poker. I, I've had, had a couple bouts of that. It was pretty fun. We used money, but we gave it all back at the end of the game. Dog races, horse races, rat races, snail races. There's nothing wrong with those. My snail's faster than yours. Prove it. You know, until you throw some money on then we got a problem. The tool that is used to commit evil acts does not mean the tool itself is bad. And we need to look at that principle and a lot of other things that we deal with today. To close the idea of gambling, I would like to use this verse, Jeremiah 17, verse 11 says, As the partridge sitteth on eggs, and hatcheth them not, so is he that getteth riches, and not by right, shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at this end shall be a fool. Now, we have this opportunity laid out before us for any of those who perhaps have been engaged in gambling. It's not the design of this particular session, but it, it could apply to you. Have you been gambling? Likewise, have you been falling short in any of these principles? Consider everything. Hopefully, at least one of these principles was heard. If, you, if you're found in violation of one of them, or even all of them, we have an opportunity to make that right. Repentance and confession, prayer, Acts 8.22 says, will bring you back into a proper relationship with your God. Or if you have yet to become a Christian. Plan simple. Romans 10.17 says here. Okay, believe, John 8.24. Repent, Acts 3.19. Confess, Matthew 10.32. And finally, be baptized in the name of Father, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. 
Also Acts 2.38. Is that something you're faced with? If you're not a Christian, why not? I know you sit in these pews and you keep listening and you keep listening. You keep putting it off. Putting it off. Why? No matter what the issue is or if you just need prayers of strength. We here are your brethren, sisters in Christ. Let us help you, whether you need to repent of sin, become a Christian, or ask for prayers of strength. Whatever the issue is, let it be known as we stand to sing.